Movie House Cinemas, proud sponsors of Conversations with Jerry Kelly. Treat yourself to a movie. Relax in VIP recliner seating without the VIP price tag. At Cityside, Glen Gormley, Macara, and Coleraine. Enjoy the show. Good evening and welcome to Conversations with me, Jerry Kelly. My guest tonight is one of the most respected news journalists in Northern Ireland, both in print and on radio and television. His career started over 50 years ago, during which time he was at the forefront of covering the carnage and the heartbreak of the Troubles. Today he's a columnist with the Belfast Telegraph and the Sunday Life, but he's equally well known as an actor, winning acclaim and awards for his performances on the amateur and the professional stage. Would you please welcome the phenomenally gifted Ivan Little. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you. Ivan, Michael, Michael Carterson once said that regardless of all the fabulous interviews he did, he may well be remembered for being mauled by the puppet emu. You remember Rod Hull's I puppet? I do, surely. Now, in your case, you may well be remembered for not being able to pronounce the word phenomenon. That's exactly right, Terry. I mean, I, I, for my sins or whatever, I probably covered more of the troubles than anyone else in television. Uh, I lost count of the number of funerals and shootings and bombings I covered. Um, for 29 years, I was on the screen uh, and I was all over the world as well. But I know my wife probably has the headstone ordered already that says phenomenon on it. Did you say it right there? Did you I did. Right? Have, well, I have to. I've had 25, 26 years to perfect it. What was the story behind that? It's not a classic cult bit of television. It's, it is, but I'd forgotten all about it. I I was um, interviewing Councillor Jim Rogers about um, traffic wardens. And afterwards, I did the cutaways, which is asking the questions you've just asked, but doing it on camera. And what I was trying to say was, well, traffic wardens are hardly a Belfast for them. And this went on for about six or seven minutes as I struggled to say it. And my cameraman, whom we all know and love, Albert Kirk, he was saying, it's not, say this, say that. I said, it's not that. And then workmen in the in a nearby building were swearing down at me and calling me for everything. And I couldn't say it. I just couldn't get it out. But eventually I changed it to say, um, well, traffic wardens aren't peculiar to Belfast. And we moved on. <laughs> There seems to be two facets, two distinct facets to your life. There's the serious journalism, and then there is the acting. Now, both are a far cry from your early childhood. Your father was a, an anxiety cabin man living in Belfast. Mm-hmm. What was that early childhood like in Belfast? It was, I had an idyllic childhood. My, uh, my father was a milkman. So myself and my two brothers, we'd get up, not every morning, but quite regularly at half four in the morning to help him deliver the milk all around East Belfast. And... That was just what I knew, you know, and and God love me, used to swerve the van a few times to wake me up. But it was uh, away from that. My parents were fabulous and I had a great childhood. Um, And in many ways, though, it it, it was a strange build-up because where we lived in East Belfast, I didn't know a Catholic until I was 18. Really? I didn't. There were no Catholics living. Well, there was one Catholic fellow I didn't know, um, but... I stumbled on a, a fight. He was getting attacked um, around the corner from our house, and they were. And I joined in to say to help him, and I was throwing stones back at the people who were attacking him. And these were so-called friends of mine. And then that stopped, and I got round to my own house, and the same fellows were waiting for me, and they gave me a kick, and then called me a Fenian lover, and I went, I and I went into my mother. And I said, well, I was bleeding. And I said, what's, what's a Fenian? She said, it's a Catholic. And I didn't, I'd never encountered a Catholic before. But you must have, because you were a Linfield supporter it will, from an early it, age. So you, you would have seen the antagonism between Catholic and Protestant. Then, well, not you? really, because there was no Belfast Celtic in my day. I mean, the 
being helping a Roman Catholic where I lived was nothing compared to being a Linfield supporter where I lived, you know, because the, never the twain did meet. But I genuinely didn't know that. My, my mother was able to tell me there was a school not far away from where I went to school that was a Roman Catholic school. So it was never mentioned in your upbringing, though, the difference no. between, between the two? Well, it's what my father had, uh, had, had, had to leave Cavan um, with his family at the time of the early Troubles um, because they were Protestants. Um, and the, he, he once said he had seen the black and tans coming down their road wrecking houses, but they didn't wreck their house. So it was hardly surprising that their Catholic neighbours wanted them to go. So they moved to Belfast. How did that influence you? How did it impact upon you? Didn't really. It didn't really? No, it didn't really. My, my father was very quiet about it. My father would never go back to Cavan. Uh, I went to, to see where he was born and I met some of the neighbours, but he, he wouldn't go back. Obviously, he felt hurt. And, but eventually, not long before he died, he went back. And he was welcomed back by his neighbours, and his attitude softened, but it, it didn't really have any impact on me. You went to Grosvenor. Mm -hmm. uh, Grosvenor. Gro Apologies. Grosvenor. Everybody calls it wrong. But anyway. It's Grosvenor Street. Grosvenor. Uh, it's Grosvenor. Grosvenor. Uh, off and on. I'll get you right. <laughs> uh, were you academic? Um, not really. I, was, uh, I had passed the 11 plus a year early. Uh, they moved me up a class. Uh, I think it's because it was big. Uh, it wasn't because it was intelligent. So that meant I was in uh, Grosvenor. Uh, I was a year behind everybody. And I wasn't terribly close. And like physically, it was weird because in the showers, I was going, what's wrong with me? <laughs> you know, because I was very small in every department, every way. And uh, it was during that s the next summer that I shot up. I'd been bullied, I suppose that's the way you describe it at school. Um, but when I got back the next year, they were all gone. I am. You just spurted, did you? I spurted up to this side. Oh, wow. And then I was expected to play rugby, obviously, but I didn't particularly want to play rugby. I didn't like rugby. Um, so, no, I, I wasn't academic. You, you, you had a passion, and that passion was acting, even at school. Well, Number tricky and everything happened in my life by by accident, really, because the my master, uh, my Latin master, who was my form master, uh, called me out one lunchtime. Uh, I thought he, I was copying somebody's homework, and I thought he's caught me. I'm going to be crucified. I'm going to be killed. And he marched me down to the 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 assembly hall, and told me, I didn't ask me, he told me I was reading the part of the third murderer in Macbeth, and uh, I did, and that, that started it, but then he, I think he saw that there was a possibility with me doing parts that most people couldn't have played because they were too small. I yeah. I could be dressed up to look like a, an adult, so I played most of the lead roles in the school plays. So yes, but didn't they, didn't one of your teachers suggest that you should go to drama school? Well, this is the same teacher, Mr. Ross. He said uh, uh, at the end of my time in Grove, he said, you really should think about well, drama why, school. Why didn't you? My father was a milk manager. No money. We didn't have, they couldn't have afforded to send me to, like they're expensive, they're expensive. Um, so I never even, but then again, I, I didn't know what to do after I left school. And, um, I certainly didn't want to become a journalist. I'd never thought of it. I, I mean, I fell into that as well because I wanted to, to kill a year. I didn't want to go to university. I wanted to kill a year after school because I wanted, um, just wanted to bum around. So somebody suggested uh, the journalist course, which was the first one in Belfast. And I was lucky enough, I don't know how it happened, I got onto it. And... Um, with the likes of Jim McDowell and Martin Dillon, we were the first and Gary Gillespie. Yeah, yeah. And I did that. And then, again, I didn't want to be a journalist, so I blagged my way onto a course at Stranmillis. I was going to be a teacher uh, because my first wife, then my girlfriend, was going to Strand. So I thought, well, I'll do that. But then the college asked me to go and do an interview in Portadown with yeah. the Portadown Times editor, David Armstrong. And I met him, and again, like phenomenon, changed my life because Davy was 
a total inspiration to me. Did you fall in love with the job then? Uh, took a while. Cause people don't believe it. I, I, I suffered chronically from shyness, and I can still remember walking up Woodhouse Street in Portadown to my first interview with real people. And I was nearly sick with, with nerves because I was shy. And I, was, I still am to a certain extent. But it, it took a while, and then I realized, I can do this. You know, I didn't think I could do it. I didn't rape myself, but then I thought, I can do this, all right. So then I did fall in love with journalism and have been in love with it ever since. So you, you went to the Belfast Telegraph after that? Yeah, which was another story. In which was, well, that was in the middle, the start of the 70s, and I'd be right, which the Troubles had taken their grip in, in, in Northern Ireland. Yeah. Were you thrown in at the deep end when absolutely. you got to the Telegraph? Absolutely. We, I think we, we it was, a, it was a, a surreal time because it was so bad. The Telegraph had set up a radio room where we had, um, we monitored the police radio and we would take a note. It was it was happening this lit, literally this quickly. You'd get a bomb here upon it. And if there were no casualties, we just told the news desk. But if there were casualties, they tried to get someone to go out and cover them. But we couldn't. You just couldn't cope. Because, and I tell a story that one weekend I wrote about 10 murders over a weekend. 10 murders. And not one line of it got onto the front page. Because on the Monday, other atrocities took over. And they all... You must have seen some horrific sights and, and met some vicious I did, and I didn't particularly enjoy that part of the job um, because I was meeting people who were giving me statements claiming responsibility for all sorts of atrocities. And, you know, and I, I still cannot believe it, but one of them actually said to me when I met him to, to hear the claim, he said, we'll have to have a Christmas drink. I said, a Christmas drink with you? And he said, yeah, I'm sure we'll get together and have a Christmas drink. And I thought, there's probably not a, a person in the world I would less like to have a Christmas drink with than you. But the, the, these people became part of my life. But if I can just digress, I don't know. I tend, obviously my, my work was dominated by, by bad, sad things. But maybe it's because it's my way of coping. But I tend to think of the quirky things that happened and... I tell this story about in the Telegraph. I was getting their phone calls from these people, and Wendy Austin said, "There's a Captain Black or Captain White on the phone for you." So I took this phone call, and the guy said, on behalf of his organisation, "We're going to kill two Belfast Telegraph reporters every week unless the Belfast Telegraph changed their policy, which we see as anti-Protestant." And uh, then he said, "We will start with Ivan Little and." I went, hang on a minute, that's me? You're talking about me? He said, yeah, I know, that's what the statement says. I said, but I have nothing to do with with the editorial policy of Belfast Telegraph. That's outside my remit. Why me and the other guy? He said, because your names are in the front page stories of the Telegraph today. And so anyway, we got into a bit of a barney, and I said, this is the guy. He said, but I'm a personal that you have an awful cheek. You ring me at home in the middle of the night with your horrible statements and I get them in the paper and they're picked up everywhere else. And we went back and forth and I was saying about my family life and blah, but I couldn't do that. And then he said, hang on. Well, I says, hang on. There's nothing personal in this. A non-personal death threat has to be the world's first. How did you, how did you cope with all that? Because going home, you're lying down in your bed at night and you've just gone through a day like that. You obviously take your work home with you. I, in so, um, some ways, consider myself quite lucky, Jerry, because I didn't really. I tried to, to separate the two. I didn't take the the work home, and I know some people did, and I, I know like other professors, like police and fire brigade, people drank to, to cover, but I drank quite a bit with the lads, but it wasn't to f forget or to push anything out of my head. I, I got home and tried to have as normal a, a family life as possible. And I, I didn't really, I, I, I tried not to, but there were times, obviously, too, when you were covering that amount of killings, and like I always say, the Omer Road bookies was the worst thing I ever encountered, yeah. because I was going up the road, and Mrs. McCartan, as you as you're in the woods, just a few hundred yards from our place on UTV, and Mrs. McCartan was saying that 
eight or nine people had been killed. And my re- I just couldn't f- take that in. But then when I got up to the bookies and parked my car in the place that the gunmen had just left, funny enough, not funny enough, that's not right, you know what I mean. And I ran over to the bookies and what I saw there will haunt me for the rest of my days. Um, it's, it's just grim. And I lived on the Orma Road and worked on the Orma Road and saw this on the Orma Road. Yeah. And I took that home. I took that home. Let's lighten the conversation a little bit. <laughs> Let's talk about your acting. Um, you love it, don't you? I do. Um, do you regret not having gone to drama school? No. No? Because I was so lucky because I was able to actually... I was actually able to become a professional actor as well as being a journalist. When I was in amateur drama and um, I was with uh, the Clarence Players and we won the All-Ireland, the Ulster, the European finals with the play called A View from the Bridge yeah. uh, in which I played Ar- Eddie Carboni, Arthur Miller play. And it was just sensational. And from that, then I got offered professional roles. Uh, well, the big one, of course, was The Troubles of Garden of Bada. Yep. Martin Leitch's. Mm-hmm. Could you ever have imagined how phenomenal that was going to be? <laughs> imagine? I couldn't say it. <laughs> but no, because we did it for, I think, nine nights. I was asked, would I be free to do it for nine nights in the Northern Bank building? I said, yeah, that's no problem. So those nine nights became 12 years. Yeah. So it did, and... It went on every way we, we did it. We were, well, I've lost count of the number of times we were back in the Opera House with it. And we were all over Ireland and we were in London. So I realised my ambition. I was acting in London. So it was, and yet I still had my, my in fact, I was working for UTV during the day in London and doing this at night in London. So I didn't. I had the best or the worst of both worlds in many ways. I had. You, you came to you mentioned UTV there. You came to UTV in nineteen eighty, eighty, which was a year after I was there a year before you. I know uh, you're so much older than me. But one of the senior uh, journalists there took you aside and said something like, uh, "Welcome to UTV, big man. You're about to lose your privacy and your family." Well, the, what he said was. Um, you're a mug, he said, because you're going to lose your privacy and your marriage is going to end. And I said, well, privacy I accept, that it's bound to, to go. But I said, my marriage is strong. And but I, in, in hindsight, both came true? Both came true, yeah, my marriage did end. And there were a lot of things that happened when you're, you're on TV and temptations come along and my marriage did end. Luckily, I'm remarried now and I'm still friendly with my ex-wife, so... And Ken, best of both worlds. Best of both worlds. And your daughter? I am a... Emma, is, is Emma still in the acting business? Uh, sometimes she's now managing uh, in, man, in a management role in the National Trust in uh, Mount Stewart, but she still does. She was in Blue Bloods. Not, no, Blue, not Blue Bloods. That's the American TV show. <laughs> uh, well, that was the she, current one. She was, no, she was in the, uh, the Jimmy Nesbitt's. Oh yeah, Bloodlands was a blood, odd blood or but yeah, yeah but blood she was in that, and she gets the odd part, but she seems to be, you know, she'd she'd like to be still full time. Well, it's a tough, it's a tough world, isn't it? It is, but I remember she was on your show, and when she was doing the play about the Holocaust, right. and she came on the, on that, and she was the the woman who inspired the play was was with her. So, yeah, that's just that's just. Your two worlds collided one night. Your political world and your acting world collided. Could you were in a, in a play in the in the Ardone, uh-huh. and you were doing the Odd Couple. Uh-huh. What happened that night? Well, again, it was one of my. Uh, it was a loyalist contact contacted me on my bleeper, and I rang him and I said, "What's happened?" For you? He said, "Billy Wright wants to see you," and we all know. Well, a lot of us will know that Billy Wright was was a loyalist killer. And he wants to see, and I knew Billy well from my days in Portadown. I said, well, he can't see me. He can't because I'm doing a play and they are doing. Um, and so he, uh, that's out. And then the play went again, I can't tell him. He said, what time's your interval? I said, what's that matter? And I said, I said, I worked out roughly what the interval was. He said, Billy Wright will be in the car park. So I finished, came off the stage uh, from the odd couple, still wearing my costume and makeup. 
I went out to the car park and there was Billy and two of his henchmen. And I said, what is it, Billy? And he, he said, get in. And he, he proceeded to tell me how he'd been harassed by the security forces and all the rest of it. I wanted to do an interview and holler again. So he went on and on on this rant. And uh, then I went, I have to go now. Have to get back. The, second, went, the second act about to start. But he said, no, I'm not finished yet. <laughs> I said, but I have, there's 500 people waiting in there to see the second act. And it can't go on without me. So, yeah, and that was, but there was a crossover too with the pantomime that, um, with, with John, with John May, May, May McFed. Um, I had taken a couple of weeks off, or eight or nine weeks off UTV, and uh, I got a phone call to say, look, could you go into the maze? Because Mo Molum's going to meet the Loyalists and the Republicans to try and get them on board of the peace process. And I said, well, I'm doing the pantomime. And they said, well, look, it's very early in the morning, so I worked out the times and thought, I can just about do this. So I went in with the rest of the press corps, and interviewed uh, Johnny Adair, Michael Stone, and, and all the rest. And then we were in the uh, Republican wing. And um, at one point I went, went, looked at the watch, and from, I don't know where it came from, a big voice in the background said, hurry up, lads, Big Ivan's got a pantomime to do. <laughs> so they let me go. Look, we many, many things to talk about. We'll have to keep a lot of it to another day, but... Your love of Linfield, still still a Linfield fan? Yep, mm -hmm. still am. And a big music fan too? Yes, I'm... Uh, and your hero's coming very soon? He is, Bruce, I got... Uh, have you got your tickets yet? I have, yeah. I uh, I was up at 8 o'clock on the morning that they went on sale and I phoned up and I was um, told I was 9,000th in the queue. But you got them? Well, I gave up. I said, I'm not waiting for 9,000 people again. So I thought maybe I'll go to... I wanted to see him in Belfast. I don't want to go and see him in Dublin. Yeah. Even though I could probably get a seat. So I rang Dublin. And this was about five past eight. There were 19,000 in the queue. Wow. So I said, let it go. I've seen him. I've met him. I've interviewed him. I'm not bored of any. <laughs> and, uh, and then, out of curiosity, later in the morning, I rang up and I got my tick. Wow. But Van Morrison is is... Probably my the greatest ultimate mm. ultimate uh, hero. Many times have you seen him? Ah, uh, must be about 40, 45, really. And I was trying to count out the number of venues I've seen him in Belfast, and, and there's about twenty five as well. And I was, I saw him the other week, and wasn't the greatest concert, but I've, I've seen, I saw him. It's but I've never interviewed him. It's bad. Oh, you never interviewed him? No, I don't want to interview him. No, well, I'll tell you about it later. I'm, oh, I remember. <laughs> oh, I remember. <laughs> got the T-shirt. Got I the T-shirt. Yes. Uh, Ivan, with last 30 seconds, any regrets whatsoever? Um, regrets? No, not really. I, I don't think I would change anything. Obviously, going through a divorce is not something you would choose to do. But again, I feel fortunate that we've come out the other end of it. And my wife's, my, my Mrs. Little too, has gone on holidays with Mrs. Little One, and it's just bizarre. We've been, we've been to several, but we were in Canada for a wedding a few years ago, and the two of them were sitting on the bus, and I just looked and thought, nobody believed this, the two of them are chittering away, as women do. But on that, on that image, Ivan, we believe it. Thank you so much for being my guest. Ladies and gentlemen, the fabulous, the phenomenal, Ivan Little. Thank you. Thank you, Ivan.